Hey there, everyone. If this is your first time joining us, my name is Scott Phillips. I'm the Executive Director of Passages. Welcome to our digital speaker series. We're honored today to be joined by our guest, Joel Rosenberg. Joel is a New York Times bestselling author of 15 novels and five nonfiction books with nearly 5 million copies in print. He's appeared on hundreds of radio and TV programs around the world and has been profiled by the New York Times, the Washington Times, and the Jerusalem Post. Joel regularly speaks with leaders around the world about geopolitical and religious freedom issues. In the last two years alone, he's met face-to-face -face with President Donald Trump, Vice President Mike Pence, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Jordanian King Abdullah II, Egyptian President al-Sisi, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, and the Crown Prince of the, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Rosenberg is the grandson of Orthodox Jews who escaped Tsarist Russia in the early 1900s and comes from a Jewish background on his father's side and a Gentile background on his mother's side. He and his wife, Lynn, are dual U.S.-Israeli citizens. They made Aliyah in 2014 and live with their sons in Jerusalem, Israel. Joel, it's an honor to be with you today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Scott. Great to be with you and with the Passages family. Absolutely, thank you. And as a reminder to our audience, you can submit questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you're a Passages alumni, you can join the live conversation during this event on the Passages Leaders Network platform. Joel, it really is an honor to be with you today. I've been reading your books now for 15 or so years and uh, I'm a huge fan. So thanks again for being with us. We'll just jump into these questions. Thank you, looking forward to it. Excellent. Uh, I'd like to get started with a question about your work. As we mentioned, you're a New York Times bestselling author with several successful book titles. How do you view the intersection of your faith and your writing? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I was joking with you uh, off air just before we started that what I really am is a, uh, a failed political consultant. And by that, I mean every single candidate and political leader that I ever worked for lost, usually big, unless uh, they went on to do well after I was no longer working for them. So in, in that sense, um, one of the things that was interesting about that is I learned a lot. I lived in Washington for almost 24 years before we moved to, to Israel. But what I, what I mean by that is that I, I was certainly a, a follower of Christ and, and active in my faith and active in our church. Um, but in the political context, it really didn't give me a lot of opportunity to talk about what I believed because my job as a communications director, as, a, as an advisor, was to help communicate and drive the messages of other people, interesting people. Prime Minister Netanyahu was one of those people. I was on his comeback campaign team in the year 2000. Now, if you know his career trajectory, it took him nine years to come back. I, took, I played no useful role whatsoever. So... Shifting out of that, concluding that I was a failed political consultant and was never going to go forward beyond that, uh, and I began writing political thrillers with a spiritual content, a spiritual element woven into each novel, this changed the game for me um, because what it did was allowed me to say what I wanted to say. I, I couldn't have anticipated that the books would do well, right? Every novelist prays that their book would hit the New York Times list. I, you, but, but you really should just pray that your mother can find the book at a bookstore within 100 miles of her house. That's your sort of objective as, an, as a first time author. But what it did, but the first, my first novel was The Last Jihad and it became a monster bestseller. 11 weeks on the Times list, number one on Amazon, 160 radio and television interviews, plus, uh, plus you know, websites and, print. And one of the things that I kept getting asked was, your name is Rosenberg. You've written this political thriller about radical Islam. But you seem to be an evangelical. You seem to be a follower of Jesus. How is that possible? How can you be Jewish and believe in Jesus? The, the, the third interview I was ever on, that was the big question. I was like, I was not prepared for that question, although I loved it. But my point is that um, uh, being an independent voice is giving me a lot of freedom. Um, and it has opened up a lot of doors that 
are, are far beyond what I could have hoped for, or dreamt of, or imagined, both in terms of writing, but also in terms of talking about Jesus, which is my favorite person and, uh, and, and uh, my favorite topic. So uh, yeah, and, and the fact that doors have opened and the people who read the novels, okay, some 5 million sold, you're meeting lots of people all around the United States and Canada and around the world who have read the books. Some are believers, some are not. Very interesting conversations always. But then what started happening was world leaders started reading them. <laughs> and that opened up all kinds of interesting opportunities, especially when the King of Jordan read a novel that I'd written. And the novel was about, I was called the third target uh, and the first hostage was the next one. Anyway, it was about ISIS trying to kill him and his family and blow that up his house. That caught his attention. <laughs> it, well, apparently. And so uh, he read it. And rather than banning me from his kingdom forever, he invited my wife and me to come and visit him for five days in Amman at his palace, at the very palace that I had blown up in the book. And so that set into motion a friendship, getting to know each other, a Jewish, evangelical, Christian, Israeli, American and a Muslim monarch. That's, that's a story in itself. But, that's a uh, wild combination. Yeah, yeah, it is. So that's, it, it's, my political life didn't really allow for that, even though I was a believer behind the scenes, of course, but, uh, but it's been fascinating to be able to be an independent voice. Uh, not that I'm talking about Jesus every second of every day, uh, otherwise people wouldn't want to talk to me, <laughs> but uh, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a theologian, I'm a failed political consultant, and I make things up for a living. So. Uh, somehow that is some, that is, those are tools that God has used uh, beyond what I expected. Yeah, that's, that, that is a fun combination and it's, it's incredible how you're able to do that. And in your books, there are these sort of these undertones and obviously the message of Christ is in those books. Um, and, but sort of stacked on top of that is, are these political thrillers that are, you just can't put them down. Well, that's, if you're a thriller writer, you have to thrill, right? Yeah. You can't preach. Now, my objective is, is to compete up against all the best uh, seller of thriller writers that are out there. The Daniel Silva's, the Brad Thor's, Vince Flynn in his day, though sadly he's not with us any longer, Tom Clancy in his day, uh, and the others. I have to compete with something that is absolutely compelling, as compelling as anything that they're doing to to hit those lists, to build that audience, and to earn it, to, to win it uh, with, with a particular reader. Because people, look, you watch Netflix, you might watch a show that is kind of boring for a while, hoping it kicks in. But very few people will read a book for more than a few pages if it's not grabbing them by the throat and pulling them in, right? So you have to thrill. My objective is to get tweets and Facebook messages around three, four, five, six in the morning people cursing at me, maybe not the Christians, maybe they're like, oh, bless your heart. But the point is the same. And they're saying, I was just going to read one more chapter, just one more. And then you kept me up all night. Now it's 6am. I got to go to work. I got to go to school. I got to get my kids ready for the day. And I, I have had no sleep because I try to write these little short, intense chapters that are like, they're like Pringles. You can't eat just one. That's, that's the job of a thriller writer. Now, in that, the question is, can I take people on a spiritual journey also? Even for people who don't want to be on it. That's a challenge, right? Because you don't get that in Clancy. You don't get that in Brad Thor or, or, or Daniel Silver or anything. So how do you do it in a way that's organic to the story and not popping people out of the story and having people go, oh, I see what this guy is doing. He's just writing novels to preach. and. But I'll just say this one thing, you know, when you're talking about thrillers, political thrillers, you're talking about life and death issues. You're talking about people dying and or, or, at, or at risk of dying. And one of the things that always, even though I love the Clancy novels and, and read most of all, maybe all of them, nobody ever seemed to care about eternal issues. <laughs> and that just struck me as odd. Not, not just from a novel perspective, but if you're in this much danger, don't you ever think about what if I don't make it? What happens to me? Where do I go? And, and how do I, how do I, where do I summon that courage from? Where do I summon wisdom from? And uh, anyway, uh, so I was just trying at the beginning to imagine how would you do that? And my first novel was called The Last Jihad. 
The first page puts you inside the cockpit of a jet plane hijacked by radical Islamist terrorists coming in on a kamikaze attack mission into the city where I'm talking to you from now, Denver, which is where my family um, or my parents uh, have lived for the last 25 years. That's how the book opens with a kamikaze attack against an American city. Now I wrote that beginning in January of 2001. I was finishing that, the last jihad on the morning of 9-11, starting with a kamikaze attack that then leads to an American president declaring war not only on radical Islamist jihadists, but to, decides to remove Saddam Hussein from power because of his connection to terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. That was the plot of a fictional novel. And then it all began to come to pass. Now, I'm not saying my book was prophetic. It was eerily prescient, perhaps. But that was the premise. And inside that was a spiritual journey. Again, it's not the dominant theme. It's a theme. Because I didn't want to waste the next period of my life just helping people lose or just writing thrillers that thrill people but didn't let me talk about what I care most about. I care about a lot of things, but eternal spiritual issues is essential to my life. And I thought, how do I talk about those things? I couldn't have imagined what played out. I didn't imagine it. If I had imagined it, um, that would have been one thing, but I, I didn't. I, but that, that created a career, not just a one-time novel. Yeah, no, absolutely. And here we are uh, 20 years later. And it's pretty incredible, an incredible story. Uh, you had mentioned you met, uh, you know, with the king of, of Jordan, and you've spent a lot of time traveling to other various Arab countries, meeting with high-profile leaders. Um, how has Israel's relationship with Arab countries changed over the past few decades? Wow. In your view? Well, oh, dramatically. I mean, um, Israel is a tiny country currently of about nine and a half, not quite nine and a half million people. In a, in a sea of 1.8 billion Muslims, um, most of whom have been very hostile to Israel and the immediate neighbors and surrounding countries have, have, have gone to war against us in 1948, 1956, 1967, 1973, uh, 1982, uh, 1987, 1990. You know, so it's the gift that keeps on giving. That's right. Now, it's true that in 1979, uh, something dramatic happened. Uh, the first Arab country made that ever to make a historic peace treaty with Israel. This was Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, making a peace treaty with, of all people, Menachem Begin, the hard right-wing Likud prime minister of Israel, who had been, uh, in Israeli terms, a freedom fighter, in Arab terms, a, a terrorist. Um, during the 1948, uh, uh, the lead up to the 48 independence war and so forth. So that was dramatic, but it took another number of years till 1994 when the then King of Jordan, King Hussein made peace with Israel. That was 1994. And now 26 years has passed and not another Arab country has made peace. Mm. But what's happening right now, the last several years is historic, it's sweeping. And I believe we are coming close. I believe in the next year or two, we are probably going to see one and possibly two major peace treaties with Arab countries. Wow. The, the, the climate is changing dramatically. It's being driven by several factors. The main thing is the Iran nuclear and terror threat. Mm -hmm. The Iran threat is changing the calculus because for many years, Arab countries thought that the United States was their defender against threats. When Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and was threatening to invade Saudi Arabia, the Saudis could trust that the Americans would come in with, you know, 500,000 troops into the region, defend their kingdom, uh, and, um, and then leave um, as, as soon as the, the, the fighting was done. Now, with, under President Obama, what you had was a, a dramatic sense that the United States was pulling back out of the region, and more importantly, perhaps to the Arab leaders and to the Israeli leadership, President Obama deciding to go make a deal, an Iran nuclear deal with mm -hmm. our worst enemy. We weren't in the room. We didn't even know it was happening at first. We weren't allowed to speak into it. We didn't get to decide. And not only Israelis, but the Arab leaders were freaked out. 
because of that and thought, what is the United States doing? That created a fundamental recalculation in the heart of most Arab leaders, not all, but most. And they were now asking, who is my friend and who is my foe? The United States was always our friend, not that we were buddy-buddy, right? The Saudis were always arm's length. Buy our oil, defend our kingdom, but don't wear a cross, don't wear a yarmulke, don't read a Bible, get out as fast as possible. We don't really want to be close to you. We just want you to buy our oil. And that was the relationship, just as one example. So, um, the, the, but, but this, so now suddenly it felt like the, the American government was taking the other side. I'm not sure that's a hundred percent true, but that was the perception. Right. Okay? And so therefore the question was, well, if, if we have to go to war with Iran, these Arab leaders are thinking, and if the United States does not have our backs, who can we partner with? And, you know, and, and who should they, who should their wondering eyes should they perceive is prime minister Benjamin Netanyahu, in the well of the United States Congress and House of Representatives speaking to a joint session denouncing the Iran nuclear deal. I was actually at that, mm -hmm. um, that event. It's extraordinary. And as I've met Arab leaders over the last few years, what I hear from them, mostly from their advisors, not the top people, is we were astonished that Netanyahu, the leader of a tiny little country, our historic enemy, could go to the could go to Washington, speak to Congress, and essentially take on the president of the United States in his own hometown, and live to tell about it. Right. Well, how is that possible? What is it, what 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 Svengali hold does the Israelis have on on America that you can do that? And they realized Israel Israelis the Israeli society has a deep cultural. It's not just political, it's a cultural and spiritual connection between the United States and Israel. And they all realize we do not have that. Mm -hmm. But Israel is the country that if, if somebody's going to go to war, they might go to war just all by themselves. Maybe we should reach out to them. Maybe we should connect to them. Maybe they're not our enemies. And by the way, these Arab leaders started realizing, we keep giving all this money and political support to the Palestinian leadership. And we never get to, we never, there's no resolution. This thing's going on 75 plus mm -hmm. years. So the calculus began to change. Right. And in that mix, Arab leaders began to ask themselves, how do we begin to build a relationship with the American people, not just the American government? And lo and behold, my meeting with the King of Jordan began to be perceived as a possible bridge that maybe these evangelicals are a group that we ought to talk to. There are so many of them, 60 million of them. They, they seem to be all around President Trump. He talks about them all the time. Maybe we need to get to know some of their leaders and let them know we are not your father's Oldsmobile. We're not the Arab hostile radical regimes of the past. We're trying to make changes. And they got a lot of changes to make. I don't want to I don't want to understate that, yeah. Scott, but, and then they saw me as, well, he's the guy that met King of Jordan. Maybe we should meet with him. I, I know this sounds weird. Why? I, I, I joked with them. I joked with the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. You could throw a dart out the window in America and hit one of the 60 million American evangelicals and invite any of them to come and sit with you and bring some others. You don't have to choose a Jewish evangelical Zionist, Israeli, dual citizen with two sons who serve in the Israeli army. You, that's not, you don't have to do that, but I'm honored that you did. And, wow. and these are not just one meeting. These are multiple meetings with them and their top people over the last several years. That has been crazy. But I think it's a, for me, it's a small piece what I'm doing and getting to do, but it's indicative of a sea change. Mm -hmm. So much so that a senior Israeli official, when I came back from the first delegation we ever led to Saudi Arabia, the first, by the way, of any Christian delegation to meet with the leadership of Saudi Arabia in the palace, in Riyadh, in 300 years. That's what they told us. Wow. Then the, the senior Israeli advisor uh, to the prime minister told me, do you realize, Joel, you're the first Israeli passport holder in history to publicly meet with the Saudi leadership? You know, obviously, they're meeting behind the scenes. 
but nobody got their picture on the front page of the paper. That's not normal. Not at all. But mm. it's part of what's happened, and it's, and it's an extraordinary time. Actually, I'm writing a nonfiction book on it this summer and fall because I'm getting asked so many questions. What is happening? That's great. Well, that's that the short be, version. Sorry, that was that, long. No, that's fantastic. That's the short version. That's fantastic, and that'll be a great read when it comes out. We look forward to it. That's great. On that note, uh, how do you believe different Arab nations have responded to the Trump peace plan and will respond to it, and also how, they, how will they respond to uh, this idea of Israeli annexation that we have okay. in front of us? Sure. Uh, okay, let's break that out. Uh, first, how have they responded to it? Yeah. All the Arab leaders have formally said that they don't support the Trump plan. Uh, the Arab League met and they 100% voted it down. That being said, m many of the Arab countries, the more moderate countries, put out statements saying, we appreciate, we don't, we don't agree with this particular plan as it's structured, but we appreciate where President Trump and Vice President Pence are going. We understand and we, we, we support their efforts to re-engage the Palestinians who have not wanted to come to the table. Uh, the Israelis who honestly say they want to come to the table, depending on the day, do they really? But the point is that an American administration would try to re-engage this was seen as very positive by the Saudis, by the Bahrainis, by the Emirates, the United Arab Emirates, Oman, uh, Egypt, Jordan, Morocco. Uh, these are the more moderate countries. Azerbaijan, mm -hmm. who's not an Arab country, but is a Shia Muslim country that has diplomatic relations with Israel. That's they're the only Shia country in the world that, that has a relationship with Israel. I've gotten to know the, uh, the, the ambassador from Azerbaijan. Uh, the president of Azerbaijan has invited me to bring one of these delegations uh, to, uh, to Baku. We, COVID has you know, thrown a curveball on that. But, but this is fascinating, what's happened. So all that to say, they, they, they don't support this plan, these countries, but they do support the process. And they believe the plan is just a useful way to try to re-energize a, a moribund discussion. Now, the frustration level with the Palestinian leadership, particularly Mahmoud Abbas, uh, the president of the Palestinian Authority, is very, very high, palpably high. Interesting. It's interesting, and you'll you'll see this. The statements publicly are are, are consistent. So I, I want to be clear: the Arab countries do support the Palestinian cause. They do want a two-state solution. They do still support the once known as the Saudi peace plan, now known more broadly as the Arab Peace Initiative mm -hmm. from 2002 and, and, and forward. They are open to, moder uh, to, to moderations and to modifications of that plan, but, uh, they, they, but they support the Palestinian state and a capital in East Jerusalem. May, they, they haven't really specified that it's all of East Jerusalem or just a little. They're open to all of that, but what they're not open to is Palestinian leadership being completely intransigent, unwilling to talk to anybody about anything. It, mm -hmm. They are increasingly frustrated. This is an issue that's gone on too long in their minds. And they don't agree with Israel on everything, but they are really working behind the scenes. And, and they want this relationship to go from behind the scenes intelligence and security cooperation and an occasional meeting with somebody like me. What they want are non-aggression pacts, morphing eventually into full-on treaties. They, why? Because they want trade. They want tourism. They want investment. They want technology transfers. And they want a strategic alliance that's set against Iran and mm -hmm. the Muslim Brotherhood, Qatar, and, and all the rest. Mm -hmm. Turkey increasingly moving into that camp, right? So this is, uh, this is a big deal. I think it's very, I think it's, I think it's picking up steam. Now, annexation, let's first define it. Literally, the term annexation is the, is the one word term that everybody is using to describe what's happening. It's not literally annexation. Annexation is a war crime. It's when you forcibly take over land that isn't yours and just decide to make it yours. Remember that the, uh, the Gaza was already given back to the Palestinian people by Israel in 2005, unilaterally without a treaty. Mm -hmm. um, what the world calls the land of Judea and Samaria. This is disputed land. Remember, if you go back to the Treaty of San Remo in the 1920s, the entire leadership of the world voted to 
create a Jewish state in what was then known as Palestine. Right. The Arabs have all these states and the, and the and these mandates. The French would carve up one section and you know the British would carve up another section. But the Jews were promised in this treaty in San Remo, Italy, this is what you get. And this was ratified further, though slightly modified, in 1947 in November, November 29th, in what was known as the partition plan, mm -hmm. right? Israel gets its own sovereign country. The Palestinian people get their own, a new Arab country beyond all the others, but only Israel accepted that, right? Right. So as the British mandate from the United Nations, without all that international legal legitimacy, when that was lifted, what was left? A vote on the table that Israel has accept, had accepted and the Arabs had not. The Arabs then made an illegal war against the nascent state of Israel and have repeatedly made illegal war. So this is disputed territory. It's not mm -hmm. occupied territory. Mm -hmm. I understand people will disagree with that, but I'm just telling you from a pure legal standpoint, that's the case. Now the question is, if Israel has all the maps that you that you see, all the uh, U.S. and European administrators, peace peace negotiators, they always create these maps. Israel will get this, and the Palestinians will get that. What Netanyahu is talking about is annexing. I would say incorporating is maybe the more fair legal way, incorporating into the sovereign state of Israel sections that are already everybody knows are going to be Israeli. These are cities and towns and settlements that most American Christians and others aren't familiar with, Ma'ale Adumim and Shiloh and, uh, you know, the Gush Etzion and, 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 uh, uh, and others, Ephrata, mm -hmm. Ephrat. Mm -hmm. There's other land too, but I just want to tie that together by saying this. Somehow in the peace plan, Somebody in the senior American administration told Netanyahu back in January when the plan was about to be rolled out, you can go home this weekend and vote to take the 30% of the territory of the Judea and Samaria or the West Bank and just make it yours this weekend, like next weekend, you can just go home and do it. That does not seem consistent with the plan in my view. And I've told senior officials, American officials at the high, near the highest levels, I don't understand that. How did that impression get left? Clearly, senior people were telling them that. Mm -hmm. But what had that done? It means that the Palestinians don't have time to process the four-year window that the plan offers for them to make some decisions and make some changes to get ready to say yes to a state. Mm -hmm. Even if they disagree with a specific plan, this would suddenly super accelerate Israel getting its part and locking it down. The bottom line of this is that the, I have talked to senior Arab officials in all of the countries we've just talked about, and all of them have said, 100%, we want to make peace with Israel, but we cannot move forward if Netanyahu makes this decision and just unilaterally takes land this summer, this fall, whatever. Mm -hmm. We can't do it. We're going to back away, and these, these peace deals are going to be off for years. So. That, that is a huge complicator. I will tell you personally, I support over time incorporating more of Judea and Samaria peacefully into the sovereign state of Israel for strategic reasons, but and also for biblical reasons. That's me. Right. right. But I don't support doing it during a COVID crisis. I don't support doing it when the only person in the world that would give us cover, President Trump, might not be there in January. I don't support it when 23% of the Israeli people are out of work, and I don't support it when we could get a peace treaty with several countries first. That just seems a set of priorities out of balance, out of whack. Yeah. I support the goals. I don't support this process right now, and, mm -hmm. and I am not, I may be one of the few evangelicals that has been speaking out during a time when, honestly, most American evangelicals are like, I didn't even know that was happening. Yeah, <laughs> right. Because they're right. all focused on the COVID and race riots and jobs here, and and rightly so. Sure, there's a lot going on. On that note, you mentioned, um, you know, the idea. You've mentioned, you know, the idea of you of of Israel using um, this as leverage, the, the annexation of the West Bank and so forth, is leverage to gain formal uh, treaties with Arab nations. 
Um, can you explain uh, why you think this could work and should be a priority? Okay, so I've written in the Jerusalem Post, on my blog, Twitter, Facebook, um, that I think the Arabs should make a counteroffer quickly, right? I think that the question should be, listen, listen, listen. If, the, if, the Arab, if these Arab countries that I've talked to and they've told me, we are ready to make peace, but we won't if dot, 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 mm -hmm. then don't wait forever, right? I mean, don't, I think, look, you got to keep, so, so I, you got to keep in mind that Prime Minister Netanyahu is the architect of the regional peace strategy. He has been saying for a decade, the Palestinians are not ready at the leadership level to make peace. They're just not. Mm -hmm. So we're knocking our heads against the wall for nothing. Let's go make peace with the Saudis. Let's go make peace with Bahrain. Let's go make peace with Oman. Let's go make peace with the United Arab Emirates and Morocco. And, America. and as we make peace with all those guys, just like we did with Egypt and Jordan, they can all keep their principles that they support the Palestinian cause, right? As the peace is made, it will help the Palestinian leadership, hopefully, in Netanyahu's case that he makes, it'll help them realize this is a done deal. You know, don't live in a refugee camp forever. Build a high-tech community. Right. Gaza is on the, you know, on the Mediterranean for crying out loud. They've got natural gas right off their shores. Very industrial, genius people. Build a thriving society. Build hotels rather than missile launchers, right? Yeah. That's yeah. Netanyahu's strategy. But mm -hmm. there's two Netanyahu's. There's the Netanyahu who wants to do that. And then there's the Netanyahu that thinks, I could be the first prime minister in the history of Israel since Ben-Gurion to peacefully, and maybe not even Ben-Gurion was, it was, wasn't peaceful, to gain territory rather than lose it. Mm. Right? We gave away territory to Egypt. We gave away uh, some territory, very little, but some rights to Jordan. So he, he, he's drawn, he, he's, he's got two desires for his historical legacy. Yeah. And I'm, a, I'm directly telling the Arab leaders that I know, appeal to the other side. Because you, if, if you just say someday we're going to make peace, you know, bird in the hand, we're two in the bush. Yeah. There's real benefits of a real treaty. Get started already. And so that's, so I think Israel should also say, look, if, if we hold back and we don't annex now, what do we get for it? We're not waiting forever mm. to define our borders and, and, and make our security. So that's what I mean by a leverage. Yeah. Um, but I don't mean being threatening. I just mean, sure. I, think, I think that's a better deal for Israel. Being more strategic about it. And many Israelis do, but obviously many Israelis see it the other way. And that, but, but most Israelis aren't even paying attention to this debate because they're out of work and they're sick or afraid yeah. of getting sick. So. Yeah, and that's what I was exactly what I was about to say. As you mentioned earlier, we're in the midst of a pandemic, and also Israel just finally pieced together a government, uh, which at any moment, you know, <laughs> who knows what's going to happen to it. And so there's all of these other things competing for energy and time. Um, and so that does affect, I'm sure, the strategy and, and, and the way that maybe in Netanyahu right. and we, others. We go back to the, the wisdom literature, right, of the of the the Old Testament, right? Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon tells us that everything is beautiful in its time. There's a mm. time for this and there's a time for mm. that. And wisdom is not about, usually about making decisions between right and wrong. Wisdom is about making decisions between right and right. The question is timing. timing. What is God's timing? What's a, what's a wise time to do this or that? That's what the debate is and I think what it should be. Um, mm. and the same thing for the United States. Uh, does the United States give a green light to Israel making this decision? Um, I'm going to be with Secretary Pompeo at an event evangelicals uh, conference in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, Friday, and are both speaking on this very topic and then having dinner together. And I told them directly, I, I you know, I would, I would want to encourage the United States not to give Israel a green light right now. Let's see if you guys even reelected, mm -hmm. right? For you to give us a green light and we make some decision in sort of shoehorning it into the political schedule, we're going to punch Joe Biden in the face if he's the next president. How does that help Israel? America will move on with the country. We can't the president of our greatest ally. 
Right. Not to mention all these other costs. Let's find out what the world looks like in January yeah. of 2021 and then and stick the four year timetable of the president's plan, which I don't agree with every part of it, but I like the creativity and I like the compassion. $50 billion for the Palestinian people, $50 billion to make factories, to build water desalinization plants, to to create electrical facilities, to create infrastructure, to create jobs. Mm -hmm. The Palestinians actually get more land out of this deal than they have a, any peace deal ever. Mm. It, it's extraordinary. Yes, Israel gets some land that it wants, but the Palestinians actually get more territory than any peace deal that's ever been offered since the partition plan. Okay, not yeah. partition. Yeah. So it's a it's a creative plan. It's a and it's got a it's a plan that's got general support from the Arab world. I mean, not with every particular, right? But with the concept. And it's the Arab states that have offered fifty billion dollars to invest to create a million new Palestinian jobs. I think that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it all gets derailed if you if you sort of jam it. Yeah, you make a compelling case for sure. Uh, just want to remind everybody, uh, if you have a question for our guest today, Joel Rosenberg, make sure you put that down there in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll be getting to those questions here in a couple minutes. Uh, so make sure that you put your questions down there uh, for that time. Uh, moving on here to uh, the next question, sort of switching gears just a little bit. Uh, what have you learned about interfaith dialogue through your various experiences? Oh, wow. Um... How much time did you say we had? <laughs> um, well, um, first of all, I, that is important. Um, look, one of the most important principles of life, of life, uh, is can I have a conversation with someone I deeply disagree with? Mm -hmm. Can I do it in a kind and compassionate and reasonable manner? Or do I have to go to battle stations because I'm threatened by the fact that this man or woman disagrees with me on this political issue or this theological issue. This is a huge question in life. It goes to the question of Jesus saying, love your neighbor. He didn't say the neighbor that, he didn't say only love the believers. He said, love your neighbor. Um, anybody that's had neighbors knows sometimes that's not easy, right? But Jesus also says, love your enemy. Oh, come on, Lord, that's, that has now defined every person I could possibly meet. Meet, meet either they're a neighbor or they're an enemy he doesn't tell us he, he even allows us to call somebody an enemy right he, you know he's not saying oh they're misunderstood maybe they are but he says if you think of them as an enemy you still have to love them so one of the things that's super hard for christians i'm talking about charismatic pentecostal and you know reform i mean mm -hmm. that already you've got people like i can't do it i can't talk to that person they're crazy they're lunatic well, they're, they're whatever we have it catholics and protestants right so that's just within our own team right right mm -hmm. um now we're talking muslim and jewish christian and jewish christian and muslim etc super complicated very uh but look i think we're in a really interesting moment where the evangelical church evangelical leaders need to be proactive to be leaning in and saying listen the only way forward to make peace and jesus tells us to be peacemakers right blessed are the peacemakers king david tells us commands us to pray for the peace of jerusalem mm -hmm. um the apostle paul says seek well it, it's the psalmist who says seek peace um and pursue it but paul tells us seek peace with everybody that you can, to an extent it, is it depends on you, be at peace with, with everybody. So that's a pretty strong emphasis on peace, not necessarily expanding borders, but that's not the main emphasis in the New Testament about how we should look at Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, security involves secure borders, but here's my point, back to the interfaith part, is it hasn't, Christians haven't done well with it historically, and honestly, other faiths have not either. And sometimes what I don't like is when you say, I I'll meet with you, or a group of people say, we'll meet together as long as we say that our theological views actually don't matter. Like, it doesn't really matter that I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and actually died on a cross and rose again. Uh, don't worry about it. I I'm not, that's not important in our conversation. No, I think that's wrong. Now we're talk starting talking about getting very fuzzy and kumbaya and oh, I love you just because we're all kind of happy. Let's just, 
Mm -hmm. I, I am not in favor of, of, of efforts that are really saying that our faiths are unimportant. I support efforts where our faiths are super important. And because they're super important, I want to get to know you. I want to hear you. I want to listen. I want to talk about all the issues that we can. Some we're going to agree on and say, how can we work together on those? Some we're just going to have to say, dude, <laughs> or sheikh, or rabbi, or whatever. So the, right? I, I don't see it that way. But, I, but, but to cite Hamilton, I believe in being in the room where it happens, right? You, you, you can't get to know people and befriend them and love them unless you are with them. Right. Uh, this is a little tougher now in the age of COVID. And, right. uh, but you at least have to be talking, right? Yes. yes. So I've been really clear when, when Muslim leaders have invited me to come and meet with them. I'm an evangelical. And in fact, when we get there, we want to hear everything they want to talk about, right? They have their objectives, their reasons for inviting us. We want to know that. But we're also clear about, like, in most of these countries, the term evangelical isn't even a term in their culture. I know what it means. So yes. often, I, I remember I, we, were, we were with the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, right? 2018, November, he was, I don't think it's an argument, was the most controversial leader on the planet that month, hmm. and perhaps still. And there we were. We'd been invited months earlier um, before the horrific, unconscionable Khashoggi murder. Right. Do we cancel or do we keep going? Well, the foreign minister had told me, you're the first Christian leadership group in 300 years that's ever been invited. This was before the Khashoggi murder, before all that horror. Do you go or do you not go? Now, we had people advise us, don't go. Right? You're going to validate whatever the Saudi government did or you know, we didn't know exactly what they did. We also believe that if they're 100% guilty, the Apostle Paul wanted to meet with Caesar. He Absolutely. Met. Yeah. You know, so mm -hmm. we're supposed to pray for kings, not just the kings we like, but the kings that we disagree with fundamentally. Plus, we just didn't know at that point what was the truth. It was all too new. So we went. But one of the things I did in that meeting was I, I said, well, thank you. And I made that joke about you could have chosen any of the other 60 million. You didn't have to pick me. But then I said, you know, I'm guessing, Your Royal Highness, that, um, that the term evangelical is not a term used much here in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Is that a fair assessment? And he laughed. And Mohammed bin Salman said, that is, that's true. That is not, it's not a term we use much. Here. I said, well, we have an ordained pastor uh, in part of this delegation of 10 Christian leaders that I brought, um, could he just take a moment and explain what, it, what, is, what does the term evangelical mean? What is it basically that we believe? Just so we're on basic terms of understanding. Later right. in the discussion, we, we said, uh, one of the members of the delegation said, you know, there's a Bible verse when the apostle Paul tells his young disciple, Timothy, pray for kings and for all those in authority. Uh, and, how could we pray for you? What are some of your prayer requests? That was kind of interesting. Later, at the end, we said, well, you mentioned some prayer requests. Could we close and pray for you, for your father, his majesty, the king, for your family, and of course, for the people of Saudi Arabia? And he, he said, yes, this has never happened before that we're aware of. That's historic. And, and, and yet, it's, when you're meeting because you're an evangelical, you should be an evangelical. I have been in rooms, uh, Scott, I've been in meetings where this particularly happens between Israelis and, and, and I mean, yeah, Israelis and evangelicals. This can happen sometimes where an evangelical leader is so trying to be so careful to be um, kind and deferential to their Jewish host, not wanting to offend, that if they say a prayer, they don't pray in the name of Jesus. They don't talk about what they believe and they don't build a relationship based on faith, they sort of set that aside because, well, Jewish people, you know, don't believe in Jesus and they've been offended and the Inquisition and, you know, the pogroms and, you know, okay, yes, but if somebody invites you to meet as an evangelical, I think we should be an evangelical, right? That's the terms upon which we've been invited. And I, so um, I've seen some good models of that. I've seen some not so good models and I'm trying sure. to do it based on what I've seen that I thought was, was healthy. That's great, thank you, Joel. We're actually gonna transition to some questions from the audience here. We have a few of these. Uh, number one, we have a 
question coming from Darian. He says, your books are absolutely thrilling and surprisingly realistic and, in his words here, eerily prophetic. How is it that you're able to describe in detail if events that occur after your stories? Well, are uh, well I, I don't consider that prophecy. First of all, thank you. Thank you for reading them. Thank you for liking them. Um, I appreciate it very much. Um, I, I, don't, I don't accept when people say that these are prophetic. If they were prophetic, they would have to be 100% right, first of all. And they're not. I'm not trying to be prophetic. Second of all, um, I should be writing them all before this happened, right? If people thought when, when you wrote a book about a kamikaze attack on America, that was prophetic. If it was prophetic, I should have had it published the year before. And it should have, the kamikaze attack should have, shouldn't have been a Gulfstream 4 business jet. It should have been, you know, a 777. And it shouldn't have been Denver, right? right? So there were a lot of differences. Yes, it was the only book of its kind that ever did something like that. So, okay, um, I, I, I understand what people mean. But I think we have to be careful as Christians not to ascribe to prophetic as to either dumb luck, which it could be, or what am I really trying to do? I'm trying to, as a, as a novelist, to also be an analyst, a geopolitical analyst. I'm, I'm running a war game. I'm looking at all the data that I can see. Yeah. And then what I do is I go listen very carefully to an enemy. I pick a, a radical Islamist leader or, or a Russian you know, uh, would be czar or uh, would be sultan of Turkey or whoever it is. And I go read what he says and, and I read their speeches and I listen and I say, what is their vision? What do they want? Okay, what if they actually started to go get it? What would that look like? Yeah. In other words, I believe that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe that evil leaders lie, but, but at some point they're telling their followers what they really want. So I take that and I say, okay, um, let's project forward how that might happen and just pick some scenario that's plausible, right? If you really read a political thriller, this isn't Lord of the Rings, this isn't Anne of Green Gables, you know, it has to, you know, it's, it's gotta have a plausibility. It's gotta be crazy yep. and dangerous, but it has to be plausible. So I create that. I think that maybe I'm doing educated guesses of what could be. I, I'm not trying to predict these things will happen. I'm saying yeah. they could happen. And what would it look like if they did happen? And what would it look like if American mm -hmm. and Western and Israeli and Arab leaders were blindsided by things that they should have seen coming but didn't? And that's a key theme in my books. And that's this. I'll wrap up that thought with this. Uh, to misunderstand the nature and threat of evil to misunderstand it is to risk being blindsided, okay? The American leadership was blindsided on uh, December 7th, 1941 by Imperial Japan. We didn't see them coming, but we should have because you look back later, there was all the data. We just couldn't conceive that the Japanese could do this or would. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were blindsided by the invasion of Kuwait by Saddam Hussein, even though he told us he was gonna do it. We didn't believe him. We just thought he's just saber rattling. That was the term at the time. We didn't think he would do it. But I you know, look at the guy and I think maybe he'll do it. That's, he says he's going to do it. Same thing with bin Laden. Bin Laden declared war on us. He told us exactly what he was going to do. He, he didn't did. tell us the day or the hour, but we should have seen it coming. And when we look back at the 9-11 Commission report, what's the summary? The summary is American leaders did not have the imagination that such attacks were possible. Mm -hmm. And I did. I had that imagination and I wrote it ahead of time, not exactly the same way, because I believed them. Yeah. That's yeah. how I think, I, that's how I'm doing this. It's not magic, it's not, I don't call Miss Cleo in the middle of the night, to, you know, or she was that nine, 900 number uh, uh, right. you know, clairvoyant or whatever. We didn't seem to see that the IRS was coming to, uh, right. to arrest her, but anyway, whatever. So. But you did a lot of, you've done a lot of research. A lot of work goes into these books before you actually put pen to paper here. Or, you know. That's true. And a lot of that is just because that's what I love to do, yeah. is do that type of open source research. But what has happened is I start meeting people who have read the books, who then are really interesting people and know more, a lot more than me. And they invite me for coffee. One of them was Mike Pompeo. Mm. Uh, he was on the intelligence committee. He'd been reading my books. A young woman who was a staffer for him, Knew, her parents knew us and she contacted me and said, I don't know if you remember me from church, but my parents know you, blah, blah, blah. Um, 
hey, my boss is Mike Pompeo, and he has been reading some of your books, loves them. If you're ever up on the Hill, come for coffee. Now that was, who knew he was gonna become the CIA director? Who knew he was gonna become the Secretary of right. State, right? Same thing with Mike Pence. Mike Pence and I became friends because he and his wife, Karen, were reading the novels back when he was in the house. Who knew he was gonna become the second most powerful man on the planet, right? That just was right. not knowable. The King of Jordan, right? When we spent five days with the King of Jordan, not, not every moment with him, but uh, several meetings with him during that time, including a two and a half hour dinner the final night we were there, I got to ask him a lot of questions. He's a former head of special forces in Jordan. He never thought he was gonna be the king. He thought he was gonna be the head of special forces command. Mm. So he's got a lot of interesting stories to tell from his own life, from his own training. When I asked former CIA directors, kings, crown princes, what do you worry about? What keeps you up at night? I get a lot of chilling ideas for these novels. And so, so that's been a blessing that again, I couldn't have anticipated when I started, mm -hmm. but it's one of the things that's happened over time. Absolutely, no, thank you. Uh, on this note, what was your favorite, this the question comes from Susan in our audience here. She says, what was your favorite book to write? And this is one I'd be interested in hearing. And what have your readers uh, slash fans enjoyed the most based on feedback? Wow. Well, that is hard, Susan, to give you a, a, an answer because uh, I guess my standard answer is they're all like my children and I don't want to choose favorites. But since they're not really my children, I guess I would say certainly writing my first novel was mm -hmm. fascinating and what happened you know you write your first novel you still have to get an agent you have to get a you have to get a, a book deal then it has to come out and i just you know it was all that was fascinating all that was so exciting and so different from my political career and and it opened up a door to start talking to people about what i really believe which was sort of the point anyway mm -hmm. far more people heard me on radio and television that actually read the book so the books, in a sense, also become a key to open conversations in the media and, and with individuals. So that was, of course, that'll always be dear to my heart, the first one, the last jihad. I wrote a novel called uh, The Auschwitz Escape, which is my only uh, work of historical fiction uh, about uh, several men that, that literally escaped out of Auschwitz in 1944. Now, I have dramatized it and changed some details with the help from the Holocaust Research Center in Israel. Uh, it's very factually true, but there's something we don't know, so I made, turned it into a fictional story to draw attention to several of these things. We just did a, a movie deal on this, and we're actually in a development deal. We'll see if it actually goes the whole way, but I just was editing the script a few weeks ago. We'll, we'll see, I don't know, but I love the Auschwitz escape because it was so different to write, so painful to write. Right. In my Jewish history and the history of the situation. The last one I'll say is, is um, I, I think that the, the, the most recent one, the one that's out now, The Jerusalem Assassin, this series, I love this series, it's totally different from the others. And The Jerusalem Assassin is about an American president preparing to roll out his big peace plan when the people who wrote the plan start getting assassinated. So he backs off and thinks maybe I shouldn't do it, but right when he's about to not release the plan, the Saudis send a back channel message. And they say, Mr. President, we don't agree with your plan in total, but we appreciate where you're going. If you would invite the crown prince or the king of Saudi Arabia to Jerusalem for a high profile, high level summit, peace summit with the prime minister of Israel, and Mr. President, you would be our host, we will come. And this electrifies the president and he decides he wants to go. His security people think he's crazy because there's bad guys out there, a terror group they've never heard of before assassinated. So the book is really about this, this convergence of the Saudis are coming to Jerusalem, the Israelis are preparing, the Air Force One is coming, and my hero, Marcus Riker, former Marine, a former Secret Service agent, now working for the CIA, he and his team are responsible for securing this summit, and he knows the bad guys are on the ground. And, you know, that's an exciting novel to write anyway. In this context, it was interesting, right? Remember, I was working on that a year and two ago, it just happens to come out this year, and so much of it seems to be playing out in, yeah. in certain ways. But also I would say very few novelists from any country, certainly American Jewish evangelical novelists, get to sit for hours with the actual crown prince. And even though I wasn't giving away things that he told me, 
you know, the flavor of being in a motorcade, being in the palace, you felt hearing it. what these yep. people think, hearing their advisors, mm -hmm. spending hours and hours and hours with them. That is what very few novelists get a chance to do that. And, and yep. so in certain ways, the most recent one that drew from the um, you know, is, is all 15 of them are my, are my No, that's to, good. Uh, you have a lot of them. So I think picking three is fair. It's good. <laughs> That's great. No, I love it. Uh, last question we have here from the audience uh, is from David. Um, as a writer, how do you see the role of fiction in peace building? It's an interesting question. That is an interesting question. Um, well, I wouldn't have thought there was, there was any role. Um, but I guess that what I'm trying to do, so let's end with a biblical concept here, right? Ezekiel 33 talks about being a watchman on the wall. Meaning if you in the old days, when, when national security was, you, you were in a city state, you were in a city, you had walls around the city, you had people standing on the walls looking for miles out. If they see an army coming, if they see bandits coming, if they see terrorists coming, they blow a trumpet and they warn people. And everybody goes to the battle stations and gets ready to defend themselves. That's how security was done in, in the ancient world, in the ancient Near East. And, and God used that to say to Ezekiel, that's what you are, Ezekiel. You are a watchman. I'm going to tell you things. And when you see threats that I am hinting to you or telling you directly, your job is to warn people, whether they're spiritual threats, geopolitical threats, or what have you. And if you don't do that and people die, you're going to be held responsible. But if you do your job and warn people ahead of time and they don't listen, then they're going to be held accountable. So in a sense, a novelist can be warning about bad things that could happen, worst case scenarios. But also in the case of the Jerusalem assassin, I can sketch out something that most people think isn't even possible yet. A Saudi Israeli peace summit? Come on, Joel. I mean, you know, dude, what are you smoking cannabis? I mean, really, I, where are you getting this from? That, there's no chance of that. Yeah. So in that same book, I can write about horrible things that could happen, but I can also write a scenario, a path that is plausible. I'm not saying it's going to happen this way or at all, mm -hmm. but it could happen. And when somebody is sitting there reading it, a lay person, that's one thing. But the crown prince is reading it right now. His father is reading it right now. The Israelis are reading So you suddenly are an uncredentialed emissary. And a novel, again, you can sit for two hours and have dinner with somebody for conversation. But a novel takes maybe several days to read through. I have their attention for several days. That's right. On everything I want to say, if I do it right. If you do it right. That is, uh, that has opened some doors that I, you know, that's really God and not me. I want to be clear, but I'm humbled. And the fact that it brought me to an opportunity to talk to the Pathogens team uh, is, an, is an added blessing. So thank you for the chance to share that. And thank you for that question, David. Well, thank you so much, Joel. It really was an honor uh, to have you join us today. So thank you. We appreciate uh, uh, everyone joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this opportunity, everybody. Uh, next time, we'll be joined by U.S. Senator Ben Sass on July 30th. So be on the lookout for details to join us for that. If you're a Passages alumni, you can continue the conversation about our speakers and catch up on past episodes on the Passages Leaders Network. So if you're a Passages alumni, make sure you get in there and sign up if you haven't already for Passages Leaders Network and get in there and have these conversations. I look forward to that. Thanks again, Joel. It was a, Thank you, it was a great honor. And uh, everyone have a great day. Thank you. God bless you guys. God bless.